most American workers think that uh, age discrimination at the workplace is a problem. And if they're past 50 or so, they think it's a, a big problem. About a third of people who are past 50 believe that they or someone they know has actually been the victim of discrimination in the workplace. In at least one corner of the job market, we can be pretty sure that their uh, interpretation is correct. In a series of randomized field trials, uh, experimenters have established that employers are much more likely to call back younger compared with older job applicants who submit identical applications with the exception of the birth date or the age listed on the resume. Uh, my discussant, Joanna Leahy, has performed one of the best known of these uh, experiments, and I talk about her findings in, in the paper. Uh, here are some um, more recent results from one of the largest of all uh, field trials this one was conducted by David Newmark and two of his colleagues. And all they sent out uh, responses to postings for 13,000 positions in 12 different cities. Uh, and the responses were randomized so that there were some identical uh, resumes which differed only by the age indicated for the job applicant. And this shows the employer responses uh, to over 40,000 uh, 40, applications from these fictitious applicants for mostly low-skilled positions in administration, in sales, security guards, janitors. And the callback rates, you can see, about 19% for people who said on their fictitious resume that they were 29 to 31, 15% for people who said they were between 49 and 51, 12% uh, callback rate for people who, who identified themselves as being 64 to 66. Um, here, the additional bars there just identify response rates to uh, job applications from one class of applicant, namely women, and uh, one class of positions, namely administrative jobs that are typically held by women. And you can see that the pattern of callback rates follows the same one you see for the bigger sample. Now, David Newmark and his colleagues conclude, A, discrimination against aged applicants is quite widespread. Uh, and B, it is worse for older women compared with older men. There are some uh, experiments in which the gap for men is smaller. Uh, but uh, for, for women, it is a fairly consistent finding, uh, and it corresponds with jo Johanna's findings. What we don't uh, have is such clear-cut evidence about other forms of workplace age discrimination. Uh, in employee retention, for example, or in uh, promotions. Uh, but I think that kind of evidence is much harder to collect, and as anybody who's tried to study discrimination knows, it's much harder to reliably prove. Uh, nor do we have any conclusive evidence on what employers are thinking when they opt to offer a position, or at least call back an applicant who's younger as opposed to older. Uh, some employers may believe that older job applicants or workers would have lower productivity if they were hired, uh, even if they hold, even if they're put in the same position and earn the same hourly wage. Uh, other employers may feel that the older job applicant might turn out to be more expensive, even if placed in the same position and offered the same hourly wage as a younger uh, applicant. Now, the goal of my project is not to assess the first conjecture about workers' productivity. I sat on a National Academy of Sciences panel uh, that uh, considered this evidence about this. It's a very complicated, tons of research, but it doesn't cast a lot of light because usually the kinds of productivity that can be measured are just subsets of the skill uh, of the job requirements and, and, uh, or occupations where it's very easy to measure workers' productivity, which is not, does not explain why these uh, kinds of positions, which require a more broader sub of skills uh, might elicit 
uh, discriminatory uh, reactions from employers. Uh, my goal in this project is to figure out how uh, age-related costs of putting people on the payroll might affect uh, uh, the discrimination uh, of employers. Some of you might be thinking about sen seniority pay premiums as, as a hurdle for older workers. Uh, uh, these pay premiums get bigger the longer people are on a given company's payroll, but note that th those seniority pay premiums cannot explain the pattern of findings in this chart because every applicant regardless of age, has the same job tenure in these jobs, which is exactly zero. So it's not, we're not talking about what happens as people remain on the payroll longer. We're talking about two observationally similar job candidates. Uh, one is older and one is younger. Uh, some, uh, the workers have the same wage. The workers have the same tenure. The workers have the same sized employer, the same occupation involved in the same industry, but the employer prefers to call back people who are younger as opposed to older. My broader project is going to focus on three or four of these age-related costs, for example, related to sickness pay, uh, uh, paid absence for sickness, the risk that a worker after, hired, after being hired and, and receiving investments from the employer for training, chooses to leave before the employer uh, uh, recoups the, inv uh, the investment that has been made in their training. And in specifically in this paper, uh, the cost of providing workers with ESI, that is employer-sponsored health insurance. Are these age-related costs large enough to help explain uh, f employer discrimination, the, the higher costs associated with an older worker? ESI is the largest and most costly non-wage benefit that U.S. employers pay. 8.3% of employee comp compensation consists of employer contributions for employer-sponsored plans. That is equivalent to 12% of the total wage bill. 60% of full-time workers between 18 and 64 obtain health insurance under an ESI plan in the United States. Uh, under the Affordable Care Act, if an employer has at least 50 full-time equivalent workers, uh, it must offer an affordable and adequate plan to its employees. And if it does not, and some of those employees uh, obtain an affordable plan with public subsidies through state insurance exchanges, the employer must pay penalties for failure to offer adequate and affordable plans. Now, the thing about health consumption which workers my age are keenly aware of, is that it tends to get bigger, tends to get more expensive as we get older. So this chart shows the association between age and total personal health spending for Americans between 25 and 74 years old. The green bars show the relationship for all non-institutionalized adults in each age group uh, as measured in the medical uh, expenditure Panel Survey, or MEPS. The numbers are for 2014. In the general population, the average health expenditure uh, uh, increases about 80% between ages 45 to 49 and 55 to 59. That's $3,340. Uh, the average expense increases 135% between 45 and 49 and 65 to 74. That's $5,600. Uh, even though employers pay for the health insurance of most of their full-time working age employers, they do not pay for all of these costs. And so the question is, how much do they pay? Uh, uh, a lot of the most expensive folks are too ex uh, sick or too incapacitated to work, so they're not in the employed population, and, and employers uh, aren't paying for their, uh, their health care. Instead, it's being paid some other way, out-of-pocket uh, uh, spending, uh, public insurance, uh, charity care. Uh, we can see this in the solid red line in this chart which shows average expenditures of the employed population. That is, uh, at every age, 
you'll notice that spending for the employed population is lower than that of the general population in the same age group. And the percentage difference between those two spending amounts tends to increase as we get older. And I think this reflects self-selection out of employment among the least healthy people, which, increase, which becomes more and more important as, as folks get older. Past age 55, you'll notice that the increase in spending among employed people almost comes to a halt. And I think that is the self-selection into employment of uh, healthier people people with lower, uh, lower expenditures uh, on health. Uh, suppose we focus solely on employed adults and the private health insurance reimbursements that they receive to cover their health costs. Now, this, this, that's what the, that's what the uh, numbers in this chart refer to. Most of this private insurance is, of course, employer-sponsored insurance. Uh, and the spending totals are less daunting than they are in the previous chart. Uh, but even so, private insurance reimbursements more than double between ages 45 to 49 on the one hand and 55 to 59 on the other. Interestingly, they decline a bit at ages 60 to 64 and much more steeply at 65 to 74, and that's undoubtedly because of self-selection by health status into employment, which becomes more important as we get older, and a bigger percentage of the spending uh, cases uh, are not employed uh, as, they, as they reach their mid-60s. Another thing to bear in mind, past age 60 or 65, an increasing share of the private insurance is not necessarily being provided by the ESI plan of your employer. Uh, uh, it might be a former employer's plan, because you're a retiree and you're one of the rare people who has retiree health benefits, or it might be spending from a Medigap insurance policy by someone who's primarily insured by Medicare rather than an uh, ESI plan. The tabulations I've shown you so far pertain to the entire non-institutionalized population or to the entire employed population or just the private insurance reimbursements received by people who are employed. But what we really need to know to figure out the cost to employers uh, is the cost of offering insurance to its employees plus their dependents of whatever age, net of the employee insurance premiums that are paid in order for people to obtain coverage under their employer plan. Uh, until the mid-1990s, it would have been very, very hard to estimate uh, these net costs to an employer, unless you had privileged access to the records of a large employer or a large commercial employer that provided insurance to a lot of uh, private employers. In the mid-1990s, however, the Department of Health and Human Services began funding the MEPS, uh, and there are two data collection efforts under the MEPS that are crucial for this project. First is a household survey of about, I think, 15,000 households every uh, year. Uh, and secondly, a, an, a, a survey of the providers of health care to the families in this sample. Uh, the uh, household survey elicits information about insurance offers that people receive, insurance take up, episodes of care, uh, estimates from the household and from their providers of the cost of the care and the sources of payment for the care. And because the responses of the households and those of the uh, providers are cross-checked. It's unusually accurate information compared to whatever we had before. And also, there's lots of indiv individual information about people, uh, like their wage, their employer characteristics, and so forth. What I did is organize this into files linked to everybody's uh, employer and the insurance provided under that workers, that employees, ESI plan. Uh, there are 58,000 employed person years in my sample, uh, drawn from 2010 to 2014. 42,000 of these person years uh, represent employment that, where the employee was offered an ESI plan. 32,000 person years reflect the experiences of people who took up an ESI plan. MEPS 
is not a perfect data source. Um, very careful uh, comparisons of what's recorded in the maps with what is recorded in a uh, large commercial insurer database suggests that 10% of spending, maybe a bit more, is missing in maps, that is, goes unrecorded. Uh, it turns out that what's missing is everywhere in the spending distribution from the lowest annual amounts to the average annual amounts to the highest annual amounts, but with a special problem of missing cases who have truly extraordinary expenditures. The MEPS has such cases. There are people in my sample that spent uh, over $500,000 a year on, on their health care, but those kinds of cases are rarer in MEPS than probably is the case uh, in, in real life. Uh, and this raises another issue, and that is the skewness of the distribution of spending. Uh, here, here, here is the cumulative distribution of gross uh, reimbursements under ESI plans per worker uh, who are between 55 and 64 years old. And you can see that uh, the bottom three quarters of spenders account for just 18% of total reimbursements. That's an average of about $1,700, $1,800 a year in reimbursements. But the top one quarter uh, account for 82% of the gross reimbursements received in the MEP sample in this age group. That's an average of $23,470 a year. The top 5% of spenders account for 40 percent of total spending, and they receive average reimbursements of $63,500. So we're talking about a very skewed distribution, and it matters what cells these high spenders are in. And that means, in spite of these huge samples that you might think I have, the plain fact is those extreme outlier cases have a big influence on the relative spending amounts in different population cells. And if they happen to be in one cell as opposed to another, perhaps because of misclassification, uh, you can get doubtful information. And remember, it's not the median spending that matters. From the perspective of insurance and the cost of coverage, it's the average that matters. That, and and so, that, that, so these answers the, that I come up with are sensitive to these outlier spending cases. Okay, this shows, the, uh, this shows the distribution of net reimbursements. Uh, and all the bottom 40% or 45% of cases uh, have uh, negative amounts. They pay more in premiums than they receive back in, in reimbursements. Think about that for a moment. Three quarters of the cost of these plans is borne not by the employee premiums, but by employer contributions. And uh, so it's quite extraordinary that there are so many people that just their portion of the uh, payment for these uh, plans uh, is, is uh, too little, uh, is, is more than the amount that they can expect to receive back. Uh, the blue line there is the older age group, 55 to 64 years old, and the red line is 35 to 44 year old. Old, you can see once you get past about the 60th or 70th percentile, the gap between those two spending curves really goes up. And you can see on the left-hand side that, in fact, the premiums of these two age groups are not all that different. How do you know that? Well, because on the, on the left-hand side, those amounts are basically just showing people's premiums absent any uh, reimbursements because there are a lot of people, maybe the bottom... 20% of young people, the bottom 15% of older people, that don't get any reimbursements over the course of a year, so that all you're seeing is the premium contributions you make. Those, those lines are almost on top of each other because the old and the young essentially pay the same premiums. Uh, so, pardon? Right. That's exactly right. That's why this is an issue. That's, that's what gives them the motivation to uh, discriminate. Well, I don't, I, let, me, let me just continue, and we can talk about that afterwards. Uh, uh, the what, what matters to employers is the cost 
the generosity of the ESI plan they offer. Obviously, a plan with very low premium charges to employ employees, one that has uh, generous deductibles and co-payments from the perspective of families, uh, obviously are going to be more expensive. The likelihood that ESI is taken up, and particularly the uh, what kinds of employees take up the author, uh, offer of insurance, the type of coverage that a worker elects to receive, individual employee plans versus family plans, uh, and the likelihood that the population that is insured by the employer plan is going to have expensive medical episodes. So that's what matters. So let's begin with the probability uh, an ESI plan will be offered to employees in the United States. These are numbers based on the raw data. The probability of an offer is much more associated with uh, a worker's wage than it is with workers' ages, up through about age 64. Uh, so for example, those bars, those uh, bars refer to what is, the take, what is the offer rate to employees who are in the middle 40% of the wage distribution. Uh, and it's basically 80% to 85%. It slightly rises with workers' age, but it's not very noticeable. And similarly, people in the top 30% of the wage distribution, they, they receive offers between 92% and 95% of the time. Uh, at the lowest, in the lowest one-third, the lowest 40% of the wage distribution, offer rates are quite a bit lower. Okay, so that's, that's what the offer is. Uh, Formal multivariate analysis confirms the basic result that you see in this chart uh, for, based on the raw data. Uh, and those results, which control for employees' tenure on the job, the industry of the employer, uh, how, how, how big the employer is, and how many low physical locations it has, uh, it turns out workers in the youngest group, notwithstanding what you see in that uh, picture, are more likely to be offered ESI uh, given the characteristics of their job and their own characteristics compared with older people. So conditioning, controlling for the influence of other factors, this is basically the right result, but it turns out that the offer rate is somewhat higher to the youngest people. Uh, conditional on an offer of ESI, uh, how likely is it that an employee is going to take up an offer and enroll in the employer plan? This chart shows uh, the raw numbers among NEPS employees offered an ESI plan. Uh, this, these are just raw numbers. There's no statistical controls. As you, and it looks like the, the uh, chances that people will take it up rise with age, which seems reasonable. Uh, but when we do formal multivariate analysis to see what the uh, take-up rates are controlling for characteristics of the employer and characteristics of the employee, uh, the old are not particularly more likely to take up benefits than are the young. Um, uh, the wage has a huge influence on the take-up rate. So low-wage workers are much likely to less likely to take up an offer of ESI if one uh, comes to them. This chart classifies ESI plans uh, according to the number of dependents that a worker has that are covered under the plan. And it shows the association between that uh, number of dependents and how old the employee is. You can see that take-up rates rise moderately with age, and then they fall short, oh, excuse me, you can, you can see that the number of people covered by a plan tends to decline as workers age past about age 50. Uh, there are uh, fewer people who uh, have uh, enroll in family plans and more that enroll in individual plans. So if you think that the reason that an older employee is going to be more costly than a than a younger one, this evidence suggests it's not because the older employee is going to have more covered dependents under the plan. Instead, it's prime age workers who have more, uh, more dependents. Uh, uh, the net ESI reimbursement conditional on enrolling in ESI 
is displayed here. Uh, these, are, these are just spending amounts in, in $2,015 over the five years in my sample, 2010 to 2014. And these are just raw numbers. There's no statistical controls applied. You can, you can see, and you can see the big standard errors around the estimates too because of the huge skewness in the, in, in the distribution of, of reimbursements. I mean, it's, it's, it's very, very wide, and so the result is that there's a very big sampling variability around these estimates of mean spending. But nonetheless, it's quite clear that starting around age 55, uh, these net reimbursements rise very sharply, and then they fall uh, after age 65. Now remember, these are people who are enrolled in the employer plan. Uh, among ESI-insured employee, employees in the MEP sample, Net reimbursements reach a peak of 5,500 at age 60 or to 64, and that's $2,300 more than net outlays on 45 to 49 year olds. Uh, so clearly, these amount, these numbers are big enough to make make a difference uh, for some kind of employees. Using weighted least squares, where the weights reflected the sampling uh, uh, probabilities of different MEPS households. Uh, we can estimate the causal effect of workers' age on net ESI costs, controlling for the effects of workers' wages, age, gender, job tenure, employer's industry, employer's size. And in my specification, the, age, uh, the effects of age are highly statistically significant, much more so than the other determinants of net ESI reimbursements. It's, just, it's the most important factor that drives among the, among the variables in my uh, specification, it's the most important variable. Compared with employees who are 45 to 49 years old, uh, 55 to 59 year olds cost $1,200 more. Uh, employees who are 60 to 64 cost $2,400 more. And employees who are 65 or more cost $2,000 more, which is a bigger number than the raw numbers suggest. So. Uh, for 55 to 59 year olds, 60 to 64 year olds, these estimates aren't very far from the raw differences in the data. Um, but, for the, but for the oldest group, uh, 65 plus, conditional on being enrolled in the plan, you cost a lot of money. Um, and uh, those results show pre, uh, per employee net costs of people who take up the offer of an ESI plan, but what really matters to an employer who has a given health plan is conditional on making the offer, how much does it cost? Uh, uh, and this chart shows the raw numbers, unadjusted for any statistical controls or any of the other employer or employer characteristics that I take uh, account of in a more formal specification. Uh, I assume that the net cost of an ESI offer is exactly $0. The, the firm's plan doesn't receive any premium payments, but it doesn't make any outlays for insurance reimbursements either, so I assume it's zero. That's probably not quite right, but close enough for government work. Uh, relative to workers offered an ESI plan, who are between uh, 45 and 49, workers between 55 to 59 cost $1,200 more. That's 50%. It's a 50% increase in ESI costs. Uh, those who are between 60 and 64 cost $2,100 more. And those 65 plus cost just $600 more. Now, that seems quite moderate. And the reason it's so moderate is because so many people who are 65 and older decline to take the employer plan once they get to be 65 and are eligible for Medicare. Some combination of Medicare, a Medigap plan, a former uh, employee, uh, employer's retiree health benefit plan means that they elect not to take the ESI plan. So that's why past 65 it does become cheaper even if the employer offers an ESI plan to the worker. Uh, it turns out that these numbers uh, are very, very close to the ones we obtain if we, if we do uh, a more elaborate statistical analysis, taking account of employer characteristics, employee characteristics. Uh, the one exception is the impact of employers, employees age if they're past 65. It's approximately twice as big as that estimate uh, when we inclu include statistical control. So given 
the composition of the industries that the 65 plus year olds are in and the other characteristics that they have and their employers have. Uh, the, old, the people past 65 indeed look like they're more expensive than, than is indicated in this chart. Now, are these age-related costs meaningfully large? That is, would they affect an employer's views in looking at the applications of different age workers? Well, number one, they exclude the cost of plan administration. Plan administration absorbs about 15% of the cost of running an employer-sponsored insurance plan. Uh, so we, we, we have to take these coefficients and increase them by 18% to reflect that if we think that uh, these costs are not per head, but instead are related to how many reimbursements uh, and the size of reimbursements made to individual workers, which I think is a more probable model of administrative costs. Number two, if misreporting is 10%, uh, we also have to increase the uh, the uh, estimates by another 11% or so to reflect the underreporting, assuming that the underreporting is more or less benign across the distribution. Uh, but let's ignore misreporting for one minute. I estimate that the net extra ESI uh, compensation costs represent 3% of median wages for 55 to 59 year olds uh, and 65 plus year olds, and about 5% of the median wage. Uh, for 60 to 64 year olds. So that's the extra compensation required uh, for these older age groups. Now for the 90th percentile worker, these are not material costs. Uh, it's one or two percent uh, of the 90th percentile wage. But for workers at the 25th percentile, we're talking about uh, extra compensation costs that represent 5% to 8% of employees' money wages. Uh, so the extra costs loom large, I think, for workers earning very modest pay if the employer provides or offers a health insurance plan. And they're comparatively far less important for people who earn, who have a very high position in the earnings distributions. Now, do employers actually pay these extra amounts based on putting these people, putting people on the payroll? For employers who enroll 60% of the uh, ESI covered employees in the United States, I think the answer has got to be yes. Why? They self-insure. No one's picking up the extra cost for them. Uh, they're paying the full cost of the plan. Some of them buy something called stop-loss insurance, which puts a limit on their liability in a given year, but they buy this from commercial insurers. The commercial insurer surely takes into account the age distribution of the workforce of, of the firm that's coming in and asking to buy stop loss insurance. So uh, the firm may be protected against extremely big one-time costs, but their premium payments are going to reflect the age distribution. And if the insurance company knows as much about this, they probably know more than I do, more than the MEPS knows, uh, they, they, well, they, they're going to have to pay it. Now there's another group of uh, employers that are fully insured. They basically buy insurance from a commercial insurer and those premiums are regulated by state and federal uh, regulations. There's currently, I think under federal rules, like a three to one ratio maximum so that the, the oldest workers can only be, uh, the employer can only be charged three times as much as for the cost of a, of a the, the least expensive class of workers. Uh, and so that puts a limit that for those firms, the, the, uh, the effect of these premium differences may be uh, reduced, uh, but still there's an added cost. Only in community rated states like New York is there you know, complete, regula <laughs> you know, complete regulation. They, they can't charge any more for more costly classes of employees than they do for the less costly uh, employees. But that is a small minority of all employment in the United States. Finally, if we wanted to reduce employers' financial inducement to discriminate, given the fact that they do actually face higher costs for providing ESI, how might we go about doing it? We could offer employers generously subsidized reinsurance for high cost cases. Slightly more than three quarters of the difference in average costs between covering 45 to 54 year olds and 55 to 64 year olds is due to spending in the top 15% of the cases. 
uh, a very small portion is due to the bottom 85% of cases. So consider a, a reinsurance plan that has the following characteristics. It pays one half the cost of cases that exceed $10,000 a year and an additional 40% of the cost of cases that exceed uh, $20,000 a year. Uh, that's 90% of the cost above 20,000. If this reinsurance plan had been in effect in 2010 to 2014, the annual cost differences between gross reimbursements for the older age group uh, relative to 45 to 54 year olds would have shrunk from $1,800 to about $700 a year. That's a 63% drop in the apparent difference. We could come up with other kinds of schemes and I'll be looking into those, but uh, the United States is unique, I think, in, in, in making employer-based insurance the key component of insuring the entire population under 65. One of the downsides is if you compel employers to offer this insurance, the realities of uh, medical expenditures mean that more older workers are going to absorb more of, uh, of the cost of doing it and it does create a built-in incentive to discriminate against older workers. So, thank you. So, uh, I'm going to be discussing this uh, great paper, and uh, uh, I, I, wanted, I didn't want to like, start with sort of an overview of what the, uh, the summary of the paper, because uh, I figured that Gary would do a good job of uh, presenting it, and he did. Um, so, uh, I want to kind of put this in, uh, Perspective. So we know surprisingly little about how older workers' health care costs compared to younger workers. Like, this, this is kind of surprising given that this seems sort of like a first order question. Uh, we also don't ver know very much about how these costs affect uh, older workers' bro uh, job prospects. We don't know about hiring. We don't know about sorting into firms. We don't know about what kind of hours this cause, uh, health uh, care costs cause workers to have. Um, and we don't know if these healthcare costs affect wages. Like, these are kind of basic uh, questions. Uh, we do know that health insurance costs may shift job structures towards fewer full time employees, uh, that there might be more part time jobs uh, uh, because they don't have to offer health insurance, that uh, there may be more overtime um, as health insurance costs go up. Uh, this, interestingly, this Cutler and Madrian paper uh, never got published. Like, it's not a perfect paper, but it's still, you know, a, a very good paper. Um, we also know that uh, older age hiring is low in firms that offer health insurance, but of course, uh, offering health insurance is also correlated with firm size, which is correlated with, uh, you know, uh, long-term firm-specific human capital investments, which, you know, uh, is uh, one reason that employers say that other employers might not want to hire older workers, because uh, you want somebody that you can train for 20, 30 years, as opposed to someone who uh, you can uh, only train for maybe 10 years. Okay. Uh, we also know that new hires who have high health insurance costs, regardless of age, sort into large firms or they sort into firms that offer health insurance, but they do not sort into small firms that offer health insurance. That's that Cozily Simon paper that I was uh, talking about yesterday. Um, and we know that uh, retiree coverage availability increases the probability of retirement. So if you offer retiree health insurance, that uh, may uh, cause people to stop working. Um, I tried to look at this question once. Um, actually, I tried to look at it twice, uh, but the first time was in that audit study. Um, and uh, what I did was I put a little thing that said, I do not need health insurance because I am covered, you know, outside of my job. And, like, nobody actually puts that on a resume, so the fact that I didn't find anything was not very interesting. If I had found something, that would have been interesting. But, so I'm not going to count that. Um, but the other time that I tried to look at this question, uh, Cozily Simon liked this paper, but nobody else did, so it's, it's in my dead papers uh, section of, well, I used to have that section on my CV, and then they told me to take it away uh, for tenure. But this is a dead paper. Uh, what I did was I used the MedStat data from 2001 to 2003, and I kind of like made these age band gender cells, and I looked at basically, you know, how much do each of these employees cost? Um, and it's not true that men at cost more than, than women. That's just because the, I, I say I normalized, but what I actually did was I shifted. So um, that, that, that's not quite accurate. But the shape that you can see, you can see that men kind of have this flat shape. And then as they get older, they cost more. And then they cost a whole lot more. Um, and women, you can see that they, they cost a little bit more uh, because of childbearing and things like that. 
Okay. The Burnless paper does a much better job than I did, so uh, I, I don't think that his uh, paper is going to be on his dead, dead paper uh, portion of his CV. Um, one of the really great things is that he's able to look at dependent costs. So um, a really important question is, you know, these uh, certain groups of people are a lot more likely to be covering people who are not in the same risk pool. They're not in the like employee in the employee risk pool. They are spouses who uh, may not be able to work because they have uh, illnesses, and their children who you know you never know what you're getting when you get uh, in terms of healthcare costs when you have a child. So. He's able to look at the dependent costs, um, and husbands are going to be covering some wives. Um, and so, like, you saw here that I had this kind of flat, uh, flat costs uh, for men. Um, but you're not actually going to see that for employees because men will be covering their wives' pregnancies, uh, especially if their wives are uh, stay-at-home moms. And the probability of covering children is going to, of course, vary by age. Secondly, he's able to look at the offer and the take-up of insurance. And these are really, really important because... Uh, you're not just looking at the selected sample of people who take up the offer, who are, of course, uh, going to be either the most risk averse or uh, the most expensive. And, of course, uh, take up rates vary by age. Um, so there's some surprising, uh, surprising to me, maybe not surprising to Gary, um, and I think important findings that I, that I want to highlight uh, from the presentation. Uh, the first is that people over the age of 65 have lower ESI take up rates. Um, and, uh, this may t uh, tie into an uptick in um, like interviews uh, that are found in um, not not the study that uh, he showed with uh, uh, David Newmark, but that is uh, their middle age is not really middle age. Their middle age is actually uh, older, so we don't don't really know what's going on uh, with middle aged people in in that study. But this may tie into the uptick in interviews that have been found in a lot of uh, U.S. audit and lab studies at these at these older ages, which I had initially thought was just you know sort of a mistake in the data. But I have seen it in so many studies at this point uh, that I think that age discrimination may be actually a little bit less at these much older ages, uh, uh, possibly because of selection into who is still seeking work at those ages. Um, additionally, uh, take up rates uh, conditional on the offer. Uh, they don't really change until uh, age 50, which was a little bit surprising to me. I thought we'd see, you know, more of a steady, smooth action and not this big, like, you know, leap at age 50 or at age 55. Uh, additionally, uh, the age group 40 to 45 has the highest dependent enrollment. Again, uh, maybe I should have expected that, but I wasn't actually expecting that. And uh, then less surprising but still important, even when we control for the lower take-up rate and the lower dependency rates, workers still get more uh, expensive with age. And this is particularly true for ages 55 um, and older. And even with that much lower take-up rate, 65 is more expensive than 50 to 54, but less expensive than 55 to 64. And I sort of thought that, uh, you've already seen this, this slide, but I sort of thought that this was kind of an illustration of the key findings of the, of, of the paper, at least the ones that I thought were the most interesting. Um, and uh, you, can, you can see those things that I was just talking about where, you know, this is flatter than I would have expected. This jump is really big. And then uh, uh, this, this uh, drops down a bit. Okay. So what would I like to see more on? I would like to see more on gender. Um, I, I want to see, you know, are these costs different by gender? Um, I want to see the dependent rates by gender because I assume that more men will be covering their, their entire families and more men will be covering their wives. I don't know if that's actually true. Um, I want to see what's going on with pregnancy because pregnancy is really expensive and we know from like John Gruber's work and uh, other work that you know, pregnancy costs are actually important in these kinds of hiring decisions. Um, and you know, just you know, surely not everything is identical by gender. Um, additionally, I'd like to... Uh, See a little bit more discussion. There was a bit of discussion uh, during the talk, but I'd like to see, uh, you know, what was the Affordable Care Act world like in 2010 to 2014? Um, you know, I should know this because I lived through this, like we all lived through this, but I can't quite remember when everything happened. Um, so which eight, uh, Affordable Care Act changes were implemented when, and, you know, um, just, just uh, give a little bit more background on that. Also, um, I think there's this, this kind of deeper first order question about, you know, Health insurance and benefits are a tool, um, and they're a tool that employers can use to shape their workforces. Um, so how do employers play with these dependent premiums to discourage dependent take-up? Like, you know, Texas A&M, it costs a lot more. For, uh, back when my husband and I were both working at Texas A&M, it costs a lot more for me to cover him than for us to have separate coverages because he's, you know, if, if he... Uh, 
didn't take up his own Texas A&M coverage, he would be outside that risk pool, and so he'd have higher uh, risk. Um, and, you know, they, they also do this thing where you get, like, uh, if, if you both take up separate insurances, they give you, like, an extra bonus and, and so on. Um, and uh, they, they really would prefer that I cover myself and then my husband get his insurance at whatever his employer is and not me covering him. Um, and they, they play with that. Um, and you might think that some companies are going to say, well, you know, what we really want is we really want our workforce to, uh, you know, work 60, 80 hours a week. Um, and in order to do that, we want them to have stay-at-home spouses. And so we might play with our health insurance coverage to, you know, sort of encourage them to allow their spouses to not be working so that they can support the productivity of the uh, breadwinner. And those are things that, you know, I, I'd kind of be interested in, in uh, looking at a little bit more. Um, additionally, and again, uh, Gary talked about this in the talk uh, a bit, uh, how do third-party insurers deal with this kind of risk? Uh, you know, he talked in the, the talk, but uh, in the paper, it would, like to, uh, it would be nice to see a little bit more about, like, how experience rating works and what kind of regulations limit premium ratios by worker age, and those may vary at the state level, not just at the federal level, um, and so on. Um, and... Uh, I'd also like to see a bit more on wages. Um, I felt that the paper kind of uh, brushed it off a little bit. Um, uh, and it's true that, uh, you know, with uh, the audit studies, we're looking at, like, uh, employer offers. But the thing about modern audit studies is that you can't actually see what the wage offers were going to be for, for these identical workers at ages. So they might be adjusting at the, at the wage level, or they might think that they can't adjust at the wage level, and so that's why there's discrimination, because they think that an older worker might refuse a lower wage, um, the lower wage that they would have offered, uh, given these higher health care costs. Um, so modern, modern uh, audit studies can't do that. Um, but if benefits are valued by workers, wages should be lower. Like, wages sh uh, workers should be willing to take a pay cut uh, if, if they are getting a benefit that they value. Um, when we're not talking about, you know, these audit studies and hiring, um, if wages are sticky in a low inflation environment uh, and older workers move around less than younger workers, um, it's really hard on aggregate to adjust the wages of older workers. So you might think that this is a reason that wages might not change uh, for older workers as they, you know, steadily get older um, in, uh, as their health care costs uh, get higher. But even if there aren't explicit ways, wage cuts, there's still ways that higher costs can be baked into earnings profiles without violating the Age Discrimination um, Act. Um, uh, for example, and here's another paper that's cited a lot but hasn't been published, um, cities with higher health insurance costs have uh, flatter age wage profiles. Now, this is, there's probably a reason that this paper hasn't been published. Um, you know, cities with higher health care costs are different. They have different HMO penetration. They have different technological distribution. Uh, transportation costs are a big one. Like, you know, Boston, it's got all those hospitals, and ambulances have a hard time getting around. Um, they have different wages and so on. But uh, it's possible that you can do something with uh, the profile as, you know, older workers are getting more experienced in building up human capital, even if you can't uh, give them uh, real wage decreases in low inflation environments. My favorite paper on this topic is one by uh, a Newmark student uh, named Scott Adams. He's not the creator of Dilbert. He's a, a much better economist than that. And, um, no? <laughs> Nobody watches Fox News and uh, sees uh, Scott Adams, the Dilbert creator, um, give his insightful economic views? No? You must not live in Texas. Okay. Um, anyway, he's got this really great um, paper that looks at what happens when uh, New York, the state of New York enacted pure community rating. Um, and uh, so insurers all of a sudden had to charge the same premium for older and younger workers. And when that happened, the relative wages for older workers increased, which suggests that there is some room for age adjustment um, for health, health costs. Um, although it, again, this is going the opposite direction of, of uh, you know, higher health care costs. This is what happens when you lower health care costs. Uh, lower health care costs for older workers. So I think that's a great uh, paper. Uh, another thing that I'd like to see a little bit more on is uh, we talked a lot about average costs because that's what insurance companies care about. But, um, and that's probably all that larger firms care about because they can mitigate risk and, you know, they just care about the average costs. For smaller firms, the variance or the predictability 
of uh, healthcare costs by age uh, may become more important because if uh, they have an older workforce, they may not be able to predict and make decisions uh, based on uh, their, their healthcare costs. Um, you know, they might not be able to make the wage decisions. They may not be able to make, you know, you know kind of basic decisions if they don't know what to expect for uh, this, this uh, how much uh, healthcare costs are going to be costing their firms. And so it would be interesting to look a little bit more at um, how healthcare cost variances differ among different kinds of workers uh, and their dependents also because, you know, babies can be, have a lot of variance in uh, uh, how much they cost. Um, because NICU units are, are uh, pretty expensive. And uh, uh, there was a little bit uh, talked about this uh, during the talk when he was talking about skewness, but it would be really nice to see uh, uh, that, that incorporated a bit more um, in terms of firm size. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, we ask a lot of legal questions in interviews, and I'm always the person saying, you know, Jim, we can't, we can't ask that question. Uh, so, you know, can you? Maybe. Um, but additionally, like, you can do, you can play with the, the um, you can play with the, you can guess that, you know, a person in their 40s is more likely to have dependents than the person in their 60s. Um, and uh, you can also play around with how you do the reimbursement rates. Like, there are a lot of ways that employers can get around laws. You said that the relative pay of older workers went up after they uh, required community rating, everybody gets paid the same. Why did they go up as opposed to down? So uh, because the relative costs of older workers, uh, it's the, the relative pay went up and uh, the older workers just cost less. I mean, you could read the paper, it's a great paper, uh, Journal of Public Economics. Yeah, yeah I've, got my, I've got my bottom line slide up here. So. Uh, so this paper answers what I think is an important question that we should know the answer to. How much more does old, uh, workers' health insurance cost employers by age? Um, and I think the answer is not much more than 30-year-olds until around age 55, and then you know, uh, 1.5 to 2.5 thousand dollars more per year, depending on you know if you put controls in and, and uh, what the ages are. Um, and uh, as Gary said, that can that can be a lot. Um, of course, it can't explain all of the age discrimination that's found in studies. Uh, discrimination starts at earlier ages, um, uh, especially for women. Uh, we don't know when age discrimination starts, but we definitely know that it starts at least at age 35. It might start before then. Um, and discrimination is also found, age discrimination is also found in firms and for positions that don't offer health insurance. But that doesn't mean that health insurance is not an important component of uh, age discrimination. Um, I, I, I think we can, um, you know, Theoretically, it should be, and uh, empirically, it looks like uh, there's uh, a reason for that for that theory to hit because we see that the, these uh, older healthcare costs uh, by age, um, and so thank you. Thank you.